Hello everyone, hello again. Can you hear me? Yes? Wonderful. So we hope you enjoy the keynote lunch. Um, and as I mentioned before, our last session, I'm Jessica Roda, Assistant Professor at the Center for Jewish Civilization, and I will be moderating our third panel um, today, which is entitled The Music of White Power, The Music of Nazi Germany, Strategies of Recruitment and Propaganda. Our two guests uh, today are Kirsten Dieck and Mackenzie Pierce. So I know you have the program, but I will introduce our, our speaker. So Kirsten Dick is the author of, uh, how do you pronounce this? Rice Rock. Rice Rock, the international web of white power neo-Nazi hate music. You have the photo on the screen. She currently works as, the, as a US Peace Corps volunteer teaching English at Poltava National uh, Korolenko Pedagogical University in Ukraine. She previously taught for the Department of History at James Madison University. She has held fellowships with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the German American Fulbright Commission, and the Auschwitz Jewish Center. She holds a BFA in music and an MA in ethnomusicology from York University in Toronto, Canada, as well as a PhD in American studies from Washington State University. Mackenzie Pierce received his PhD in musicology from Cornell University and is currently a visiting fellow at the Mendel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. His articles have been published or are forthcoming in the Journal of Musicology, 19th Century Music, and in the first edited volume devoted to the composer, Roman Pallister. His research has led to the collaborations with international scholarly communities and performers. A highlight of his work was the scholarship and performance festival Forbidden Songs in the spring of 2018, which features six US premieres of works by Roman Pallister and the premiere of Poland's first post-war future film with new English subtitles. His research has been supported by fellowships and grants from the Poland Museum for the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. The Title VIII program of the US State Department the Kuchusko Foundation and the Bieniecki Foundation. Sorry for my Polish. <laughs> so thank you both uh, for joining us um, today. So I would like to mention that this panel will be a little bit interactive because we'll have, um, we're talking about music, so we'll have some videos and also uh, we'll base our discussion on, on certain photo. So to start our conversation, um, as specialists in, um, in music, both of you and music and Holocaust memory, you both focus on two different aspects of this relationship. Uh, Kirsten Dick, you published on white power and neo-Nazi music, while Mackenzie Pierce, your research was on Polish and Jewish musical underground scene in Poland that defies Nazi uh, musical propaganda. So you were really looking at the resistance um, music. So from this perspective, I would like to hear from you um, about the, rec the method of recruitment by individuals who propagate a certain um, ideology. And more specifically, if you identify certain patterns in the way music is used um, to recruit and to transmit a certain um, message. All the... So... Maybe, um, uh, yes, Kristen, let's, uh, let's start. Um, yeah, so uh, there certainly are patterns um, in, in how music gets used to uh, recruit people into extremist groups. We had Christian Picciolini here this morning talking about how music played a role in his recruitment into extremist groups, and I think um, his experience is relatively typical. They do tend to, as he said, target people who are kind of emotionally vulnerable, which is often young people, but it can also be, you know, um, grandma and grandpa watching Fox News at home and things like that. Um, <laughs> So, and you know, I, like I live in Ukraine right now, and I, my students come in complaining about how their grandma and grandpa watch like the Ukrainian version of Fox News, mm -hmm. and it's 
you know, could come out with these crazy conspiracy theory ideas, you know, about different political candidates running in the in the election and stuff like that. So it's not limited to America at all. Um, but the really interesting thing is that a lot of the research that's out right now um, is sort of suggesting that while music can um, practice emotional punch, mm -hmm. it can pull you in, it can suck you in, you know, those videos with the really um, schlocky music or the, the ISIS music or, you know, whatever it is. Um, can it, can it can work to draw you in, but the music can't hold you there. Um, if it's only the music that is tying you to the movement, if you don't have social stakes in it, if you don't have, um, for example, financial stakes or friends, social ties in the movement and stuff, uh, like the music is not going to be enough to hold somebody in long term. What it can do is to help reinforce and cement social ties among people in a movement, so you see, you know, people in religious movements, for example, who have been in the religious movement for 85 years of their lives, continuing to listen to the same hymns that they listened to as a child, and things like that, because it does bond them together when they sing or when they listen and things like that. But um, it, you know, so, so it's an important part of recruitment. But if it's the only part of recruitment, then it doesn't um, doesn't tend to produce recruitments that last. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Mackenzie, would you like to respond to this question in relation maybe to the resistance? Because this is, when we talk about the recruitment of radical groups, there is, and, and especially in relation to, to, to music or to a certain musical aesthetic, there is also the other side. So there is a kind of a position, positionment here, yeah. so in relation to your work. I think that's right. I mean, Nazi-occupied Poland in many ways is an extreme example of these radical views in practice. Um, you're operating under a system of occupation that's incredibly brutal and also a testing ground for these racial ideologies to be, in fact, implemented. So what you see is musical performances being used to project cultural power and to create cultural hierarchies. So on the one hand, the occupiers are very intent to ban um, performances, mm -hmm. not all performances, but ones that are especially associated with high culture and with Polish national traditions. On the other hand, they're also committed to opening up large German-focused cultural organizations like symphony orchestras. So you have a seeming appearance of German cultural strength and Polish cultural weakness. This is in many ways even only amplified across the ghetto walls where there's kind of less concern about the content of those performances, but it's even more cut off from the broader, the broader segment of, of the world. So this, this creates an interesting and very challenging space for musicians to operate in. Because on one hand, they're seeing, they're seeing their livelihoods and their culture being used against them and projected as a certain type of propaganda. It also creates lots of opportunities for musicians mm -hmm. who are associated with the underground movement to define themselves against the occupation. Um, so they end up often going back on older social networks, people they knew, friendships, and recruiting starts in that way. It starts mm -hmm. from people they know. But the fact that the occupiers have made culture into an important issue in Warsaw at this time makes it easier for them to recruit because their work seems more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So in that way, you get a kind of back and forth right. between what's happening between Nazi propaganda and what's happening on the ground mm -hmm. between other musicians. So you both brought us um, two photos in relation to, to, to our, our conversation here. So um, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the photo that you brought um, from um, this one from 1933, uh, Kristin, and, and then Mackenzie, if you can talk about it. I know it's very difficult to see the, <laughs> the, the, the screen, but I guess you all are able to, 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 to see, I mean, at least in the audience. So, Kristin, if, the, if you want to comment a little bit on, on this, 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 this picture and how, what does it tell us about, um, you know, the, the role of music in, in, at the specific time in 1933? Uh, yeah, so these are members of Hitler's Sturmabteilung, the, the brown shirts, um, who at this time were still fairly powerful. 
um, they the, like the next summer, the head of the Storm Mob Tai Lung um, was executed, and it sort of turned into a less powerful organization. But at this point, this is Hitler's paramilitary organization, and they're picketing a Jewish store um, behind them. Yeah, I mean, you can see it's uh, it's a Woolworths. Um, uh, yeah, so, well, pre presum <laughs> presumably they're there um, picketing for, um, in any case, all right, not Jewish, but um, they're, they're in Alexanderplatz um, picketing Woolworths, which is not Jewish, thank you to the wonderful members of the audience who corrected me on that one. Um, this is March of 1933, so this is less than a month after the Reichstag fire. Um, this is just like two months after Hitler was initially elected to mm -hmm. office. And this is the center of Berlin. Alexanderplatz right now is where the Fernsehturm, the, the big TV tower yeah. stands. It uh, didn't at the time, but it's one of the, the central plazas in Berlin. Um, and this would have been sort of one of the flagship mm -hmm. stores in, in Berlin. And they're there making a point here, a political point, um, with music. Yeah. And by certainly singing a specific song, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so we have no idea what they're singing, but this is going to draw attention mm -hmm. to what they're doing. That's often the point of music at these kinds of events. Um, you see at, at book burnings, at public humiliation ceremonies and things like that, um, music is drawing people in from across the plaza. Music is pulling people in from across the street. What's going on? What's the noise? A lot of the time they'll have children this is this isn't mm -hmm. children, but there are you know photographs and photographs and photographs of children playing instruments. We can presume um, not as virtuosos, kind mm -hmm. of just making noise yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. So we are talking now about specific performance. We'll uh, further on we'll discuss much more this difference in terms of performance. And today, the process of recruitment and social media. So the difference that we can see today it, at this time versus today in terms of recruitment. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mackenzie, would you like to talk about sure, this, yeah, this yeah. very interesting um, uh, photo? This Yes, this we, one. That, that you also um, brought us to discuss this, this kind of idea of recruitment through uh, and maybe the resistance in relation to that. So this is a program from the Philharmonic Orchestra of the General Government. The General Government was the occupational government for much of Poland at this period. This orchestra was recruited primarily of Polish musicians. It had a German first violinist and a German conductor and was organized on the bequest of the uh, General Governor Hans Frank. And the idea of this was that it was to be a high level, normal functioning orchestra but it was to show the kind of cultural state of the German nation as an occupier. So you can hear, see here they're playing Wagner, Bruch, um, Strauss, Tchaikovsky. Um, and at the same time, this also points to some of the challenges that individual musicians would have faced. Mm -hmm. They were recruited as far as memoirs and documents show, both by being offered better pay for participating in the orchestra and also often through coercion. So you have here, a, kind of German cultural organization being staffed mostly from local populations. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, my second question is, um, so as you, you, you can see that in my previous question, I deliberately mentioned musical and political actors separately. Um, as I think here, there is a complex dialectic between the idea of being a musical actor, and I think the example that you just raised is fascinating. Uh, because evoking music and propaganda, we distinguish the musical actors, their artistic productions, and political actors. So these three dimensions are not necessarily aligned, and uh, sometimes musical actors can be main or even secondary actors of the propaganda but they can also be politicized or forced to participate in such propaganda or simply having their artistic production giving a different meaning than the one that they initially intended. So would you like to tell us a little bit uh, about this dialectic, if you observe, uh, if you can give us a sort of specific example in relation to your research among musicians versus the products and uh, political ideology? Yeah, so a big example of that in occupied Warsaw is the justification of um, doing music because you need to make a living versus doing music because it has a sort of cultural role to play. 
musicians are like anyone else. In a time of great hardship, they need to earn an income, and it's difficult to kind of pr procure basic material goods at this period. So hundreds of them turned to playing in cafes. Um, and if we could put the, the image mm -hmm. up there, this is the interior of one of these uh, cafes. It's not a mu picturing a musical performance, but there was a piano in the back, and you could partake in, in this. The repertoire in this could range from anything from background music, light jazz accompaniments, all the way to chamber music concerts. Mm -hmm. So these events were both a way for musicians to earn a living, but they also had, or they are also given often greater cultural significance. Mm -hmm. right? We are able to continue making art and music despite these conditions. So in that way, they ha musicians had to, to navigate this tension or this dichotomy between the meanings that their work could have and the very real reality that they had to continue mm -hmm. to survive. That also played out in the decision to participate or not to participate in Nazi cultural organizations. Yeah. Um, and here, although there was a lot of coercion and pressure, also lines were drawn by members of the underground. For mm -hmm. example, one conductor named Adam Dolzhitsky was commonly attacked in the underground press for being overly accommodating of the Nazi mm -hmm. occupiers, for um, announcing works in German and for kind of demeaning himself in front of the audiences. So even though he was arguably in a quite difficult position, still boundaries could be drawn about acceptable and unacceptable behavior in those yeah. circumstances. And Kirsten, in, in your work, uh, we are in a different world. We talk about uh, white supremacies mm -hmm. and neo-Nazi music. Um, is there also, a, we imagine, or this is my idea also reading a lot of different work, that there is a kind of correlation on being in, and this morning we had a, somebody who was part of a, of a band and he was also embracing the ideology, the, the, the white supremacy ideology. So is there also a kind of a direct alignment in, your, in what you observe in, in, with white supremacy um, and their relationship with music? So, or can we imagine that they also hired some musician who had nothing, nothing to do with this ideology? Or how can we, can we? Um, separate both the ideology and, and musical actors and their product. In terms of white power music, um, I, I think most, I, I would certainly never go so far as to say all, but I think most of the people who are making it and performing it are people who have some sort of an affiliation with the ideology simply because the social stigma against um, being a neo-Nazi up, up until at least, you know, two or three years ago in America was huge and you could lose jobs for playing in a neo-Nazi band or, you know, your, your concert could get picketed or broken up by law enforcement agents and things like that. Um, so they didn't tend to just pull in a random guy to fill in for, for the bass mm -hmm. player or something. They would pull in somebody from another neo-Nazi band. Often, often. I mean, that, that's not necessarily um, across the board. Now, you will get some bands that a lot of uh, uh, fans of neo-Nazi rock music, like the rock music from the 90s, will often listen to a set of non-racist bands that were kind of around the periphery, some of the oi punk and... Um, heavy metal bands who kind of knew people who knew people um, and it's certainly true that a lot of the earliest neo-nazi rock music musicians in the 80s were performing um, on stages you know before they really politicized into neo-nazis were performing on stages with bands like Susie and the Banshees who are you know wearing swastikas sort of mm -hmm. as provocation or David Bowie wearing a swastika as provocation and um, like the Ramones who had Jewish members or you know singing Blitzkrieg Bop and, and, and these guys were in the same circles sometimes on the same stages. Um, where I really see a dichotomy is in things like um, music torture in Guantanamo Bay hmm. um, where they actually, um, the federal government uh, received cease and desist orders from some musicians whose work they were using. Um, I think most notably uh, a guy who named Christopher Cerf who was composing for the television show Sesame Street. Mm. His music was being used for like, you know, two weeks straight 
at top volume <laughs> to to torture people. And there were a few other musical acts who, you know, formally legally requested that the government stop using their music. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, my third question, uh, and the one that I would like to address, is the, the, the one related to musical aesthetic and propaganda. Because there is a tendency, and I'm sure in the audience, we all, when we're thinking about this panel, you all think uh, about songs and the power of uh, lyrics, more specifically, explicit text setting into music uh, to, in relation to white supremacy and music. However, we know that the process of recruitment and propaganda via music does not only involve songs, but also instrumental music. And even the concept of a good music was central under the Nazi regime, as well as the suppression of specific musical genres, as modernist and cosmopolitan aesthetic was considered a threat to the regime, the Nazi regime. So, in this perspective, it seems essential to consider the aesthetic battle that existed between the regime and its opponent or the underground scene. Um, so I think this is a, a conversation that I would like to have uh, in the case of white power in relation to uh, its opposition. Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about this aesthetic battle and if we, we have an example of a music where there is no lyrics but is associated to, to um, white supremacy and neo-Nazi. So can you tell us a little bit about, the, about this aesthetic battle that we can have uh, within, within the white supremacy uh, movement? Yeah, I mean, aesthetics are changing all the time. So the things that were effective recruiting tools sonically 20, 30 years ago, the really hard, loud rock music is not going to attract a 15-year-old today. I mean, which is why a lot of the music that we're seeing now is sort of a little bit more electronic. You're even starting to see some, mm -hmm. some hip hop and stuff, which they always swore that they would never, never, never do. But, you know, <laughs> as soon as that's what they need to get the 15-year-olds, sure enough, they're on board. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different aesthetic styles that that will pull uh, pull people in. And they a lot of the music um, does have lyrics that are violently white power. A lot of it has lyrics that are sort of bailed white power. And then there is the stuff that has no lyrics or the lyrics are incomprehensible, but it's got this sense. Um, a lot of the National Socialist black metal from Scandinavia in the 90s, for example, had these um, like Hollywood-esque soundscapes mm -hmm. behind them. It really sounded like the um, soundtrack to Braveheart, mm -hmm. or or something like that, with the the war drums and you know sometimes a little bit of like fiddling or something um, over top of these screeching electric guitars. And yeah, you might not be able to understand the lyrics, but you're mm -hmm. getting this again this punch in the gut, which is part of what music brings to the table, that it's not just the lyrics. Mm -hmm. If it were just the lyrics, we would never have the recordings. Yeah. yeah. Can we listen to this excerpt that you sure. gave us to us? So. Yeah, this one samples some stuff from, uh, I, it sounds like from, from Nazi stock footage, basically, from, from the 1940s. Samples like jackboots on the concrete, samples air raid sirens toward the end of this. We probably won't get toward the end of the song, but a lot of the sort of iconic sounds of the Third mm -hmm. Reich as conveyed to us by History Channel documentaries um, <laughs> get used as, as samples in this what's called fash wave or, or fascist wave um, electronica. Okay, so let's listen. It works for us. Join the Cyber Nazi Division. supposed to make this sound was working properly. There we go. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We have a sense. Yeah, you have a sense anyway. Okay. Using, using the boots on the concrete as the drum beat behind it. Yeah, so... 
Yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the audio, the, but you have a sense of, of the, 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 the electronic version. Um, maybe now the, the, the question to Mackenzie, um, while uh, our technicians are preparing the, the video uh, that we have for you, this uh, wonderful video. So would you like to introduce a little bit this, this clip in relation to, to this aesthetic battle? Yeah. I would say that aesthetics were extremely important to musicians who were involved in both the underground and in the occupation of this time. And you're absolutely right that some of that had to do with the content of songs, um, but a lot of it had to do with how musical style could convey meaning. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to play for you is a clip from a 1947 film, the first post-war film released in Poland. The central conceit of this film is it's the story of the occupation is told through song different anti-German songs. This scene, however, shows something slightly different, and that is a concert held in a private apartment <laughs> of music that was illicit. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, to some degree, a work of memory. This is from 1947, and people are looking back on what happened in the war. Yet it's also going to articulate some pretty important ideas uh, to people who were alive at that time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a concert, and we're going to cut away to the music that was deemed acceptable to Poles of the time. So I think we should just listen to it, and then I'll talk a little bit more. Okay, great. Ten polonez, mazur, kujarek, go tego nie wolno było grać. Zakazane melodii. A Chopin w ogóle był niedozwolony. No tak, ale czy mogli tego dopilnować? Na przykład u nas w domu. W każdą sobotę o godzinie 6 po południu przychodzili na te zakazane koncerty, wiele ryzykowali, ale ryzykowali i przychodzili, bo przez godzinę, dwie byli tu w Polsce, a nie w generalnej gubernii. I to był cud Chopina. Warto więc było ryzykować. Takie koncerty podtrzymywały ludzi na duchu. Odciągali ich od rozrywek, którymi okupant chciał zdeprawować polskich niewolników. Zamiast muzyki dawała nam propaganda niemiecka tandetną muzyczną. Zamiast teatru inny. What you have there is two musical styles fighting it out. The Chopin standing in conveniently for the nation and resistance. And there's no accident there that that's a mazurka, which has a long kind of history of being associated with resistance in Poland. And on the other hand, this kind of trashy, they're calling it commercial music of the dance hall. Mm -hmm. That itself is an interesting kind of flipping of a lot of Nazi racial thinking, which would see jazz as a sort of um, degraded form of music to begin with. But in this context, the film is able to, to kind of invert that aesthetic hierarchy, giving high ground to classical music and putting down other genres. Mm -hmm. And how do people, it was part of a certain discourse also in relation to this musical aesthetic, which kind of um, strategy they were using to, to transmit this idea that, okay, this musical style is associated with this kind of group of, in this sense of belonging, mm -hmm. you know, you will, you will be part of this group or you will be part of that group. So it's much better if you're listening to this musical style or if you're listening to a specific musical style, it will be uh, associated with a specific ideology or specific group. Yeah, it's a good question because this is a film looking back. So mm -hmm. it, it has the, the benefit of hindsight, right? I think at the time that had a lot more to do with which social circles you moved in. 
if you went to private concerts, it was a certain kind of person. If you went to cafes, if you went to other kind of public performances. Mm -hmm. So certainly for people who were deeply involved with music, these kind of aesthetic ideas were transmitted interpersonally and transmitted through being involved in these performances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because we're talking now about performance, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I'm, I would like to push a little bit more this question of different space, musical space, and how it is related to also how people will act. This morning, we, we discuss um, about um, the fact that maybe today music is not as efficient as it is today because of social media. Uh, so, and, and specifically performance are not as attended as they could be. Um, so I would like to ask you both of you if you can think about uh, musical space as a way also to relate to a certain uh, social groups. Uh, so maybe starting with, uh, with you, Christian, if you can tell us first about this dynamic, uh, how can we think about the place and the role of music today in comparison to the 90s? Um, uh, because we have, we have the social media and indeed the performance are not so attended. Yeah, so what happened uh, with white power music in the 90s was there was this period of somewhere like 10, 10 to 15 years when music became just incredibly important to white power movements worldwide. You had suddenly internet technology uh, becoming really widely available, but not very good yet. Um, and so what they could do is they could sell compact discs. Um, hmm. They could sell, in, in some cases in the early years, they're also selling like cassettes and, and things like that. Um, and then as you get into the 2000s, suddenly you had file sharing cut the legs out of the businesses. Um, so, so bands aren't making money off their CDs, the record labels aren't making money, and a lot of the record labels folded in these big cataclysmic scandals where, you know, one guy gets accused of being a pedophile, another guy, it turns out that his mother was Mexican and he'd gone to Thailand on a sex tour and, and, and like I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> sometimes truth is stranger than fiction but I think what really happened to those record labels was that they couldn't turn a profit anymore because there would have been, mm -hmm. there, there certainly still are record labels that are offering, uh, that are operating but, but they're kind of limping along at this point and it's mostly people who are self-producing. Another reason for this um, like electronic stuff is that you can do that by yourself without needing eight guys in mm -hmm. a recording studio, and it, it is mostly guys, not exclusively guys, but, but mostly guys who are doing this. Um, so it, the sound of the music has changed, the role of the music has changed, but I do think that in the last two or three years it's become more acceptable to have concerts. Again, there were many years um, after a bunch of public debacles with uh, Oi punk concerts, especially in, in England and some in America, where they were getting shut down by law enforcement, where they were getting heavily, heavily targeted by anti-racist protesters. Um, the guy who founded the biggest record label, neo-Nazi record label in the world, um, ended up going to jail for a year and then renouncing Nazism after a, one of his band's concerts got targeted by um, anti-racist picketers and he kicked a girl in the head with steel-toed boots. And which, yeah, gave her, like, lasting brain damage. I mean, she, she's functional, but, like, lasting damage. Um, so they started going underground, and they would only give you the concert venue information for, I mean, this is probably um, 20 years when, when they were trying to be a little bit careful, at least, about who was going to be allowed to know the details of the concert venue and trying to hide that from police, trying to hide that from anti-racist activists, um, sometimes trying to hide from the venue owners the nature of the gathering that was going to happen there until they actually mm -hmm. arrived and like, you know, by the way, our backdrop's a swastika, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes not. Sometimes the venue owners would be fully on, on board with it. And it, so, so things are changing. The question is which direction are they going in right now? Um, and, and that one, of course, is up in the air. Are we going back to the bad old days when you really did have, you know, Ian Stewart Donaldson on stage at a punk concert, 
playing after a non-racist band and get, you know his band gets up and they give a Nazi salute and they get down and a non-racist band gets back up and, and you know mm -hmm. and then a bunch of really really angry people burn the venue down. I mean, yeah. Okay, great. I, I, I'm <laughs> <laughs> that was a mixture of in two or three different concerts, but all of those are things that happened in London in the 80s. Okay. Uh, maybe a question about your own research and your um, access to the different material you're uh, dealing with. Uh, maybe first, um, Mackenzie, if you would like to tell us a little bit, because I know you, you, you did uh, some research in Ukraine and uh, in Poland as well, mainly in Poland. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know you went to Lviv, for instance, and, and um, uh, what we know about the access of archives, especially in relation to that specific time, is... Uh, and could be a little bit controversial and not easy to access. So if you want to tell us a little bit about, about uh, your relationship with the, with the field and the archives, and then Kristen, I will ask mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah, I've been blessed to have extremely supportive archivists and librarians and friends and colleagues helping me out all along in this research. I would say that the, um, the types of material I'm dealing with, the problem is usually less overt censorship, and it's more uh, censorship through disorganization, or that they don't quite understand what it is that I'm, I'm looking for. And of course, every type of archive has its own sort of means of access and, and means of gatekeeping. Um, and this gets to the, perhaps to a larger point, which is that in many ways, the, the history of the Second World War in Poland is being celebrated and championed and often in ways that are, I think, troubling, mm -hmm. um, that have to do with a very complex politics of memory about who has a status of victim and who has a status of perpetrator. And in a society like that during the occupation, those lines are blurred in all kinds of really challenging ways. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's great interest in going back to that period and to its artistic life mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, Kirsten, would you like to tell us a little bit about your access to, to, to this field? Which kind of method do you, do you employ um, and do you deal with? What I have done mostly is work with stuff that is available on the internet. I did a lot of work on Stormfront, for example. I was, you know, several hundred of those several million hits on, on Stormfront. <laughs> Um, when I first started doing this in 2007, it was extremely challenging to get hold of stuff. I mean, this is um, like YouTube had kind of just become popular. Um, and this is in 2007, I mean, this is the era when like Obama's running for president and these um, like white power activists were not real. Uh, happy about talking on the record to somebody from a university. I made a few overtures trying trying to make contacts with people and kind of got swiftly shut down. I know other activists um, and other researchers were working doing field work, but the interesting thing that I'm finding now is people are like more interested in talking. So the book that I published was almost exclusively stuff that I was trawling off of the internet, but um, now I think is kind of a ripe moment where people are feeling less stigma um, and less repercussions for speaking on the record to, uh, um, to academics. And you see people you know, saying there's no such thing as bad publicity, so these people don't like me, but I'll still talk to them, I'll still give interviews, some, some of the big name um, people in the alt-right and various other forms of this movement um, will actually talk now, yeah, will actually talk about their music. Um, so if, uh, if there's any direction that I was going to take future research on this, it would probably be that to actually say, okay, you know, I've, I published this book and now I'd like to write this one. Do you want to talk to me? Mm -hmm. um, but but it was it was tough, and some of the things like I wound up actually having to buy some materials from Resistance Records, which was that biggest record label. Um, it, it kind of um, folded a few times and limped back up, and now it, I think I think it may be done for good. But I wound up sending them fifty or sixty dollars worth of my money 
just to get access to back copies of their magazine, which ended up being really, really helpful. But you know, now those are available nowhere except archives. Okay, but, um, now I would like to address and uh, to talk about the political implication of uh, the Nazi Germany musical propaganda in our contemporary society. Um, so discussing the current iteration of this music today or how can we think about this music in relation with prevalent radical groups. So Kirsten, you have published um, a book on, on the international web of uh, white power and neo-Nazi hate uh, music, where you highlight the global character of white power uh, music scenes and their international ties. So you look at white power in different regions like Europe, West and Eastern Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, Australia, United States, Canada and Latin America through the lenses of artists. So, could you tell us a little bit about this transnational movement and, and a kind of a difference that we can see between these different movements and how um, do they recall to Hitler's Nazi, Nazi and even to neo-Nazi music? Is there a kind of a global network and what is the link or what is their knowledge of um, neo-Nazi music or Nazi music, sorry? Uh, how can we think about this, this link between both? I would say in general that their knowledge of Nazi music tends to be quite high. I mean, they all have YouTube, they've all done Google searches, and um, I will routinely see, you know, when they're, they're posting neo-Nazi stuff from today, like they'll, they'll often have, a, you know, Nazi marches, some of which are, a, f a very few of which, I think, of the original Nazi marches are explicitly racist, and the vast majority of which are, are not at all. Mm -hmm. Lyrically, um, going back to your earlier question, um, uh, the Nazis sort of politicized a lot of things that when you listen to the, mu the music, it like, oh, this is a, a lovely love song. The, the song Erica, for example, um, is just a, a love song to a girl, you know, running across the heath that they're, you know, compared to a flower, it's lovely but it was so used by the Nazis um, that it is a Nazi song. And when you hear it, like the only time you ever hear it is like on a documentary about Nazi Germany. And th this happened you know, fairly frequently that they would marshal stuff that um, was not explicitly racist. Mm -hmm. They were pretty uh, circumspect, I think, in the lyrics to most of their songs. Um, so th yes, th I think, the people who are operating today are aware of that music, and some of them do use it as, mm -hmm. as we saw, um, sample it. That happens in you know a, a fair number of songs. In terms of differences and, and similarities, um, there's a lot of interplay and in, exchange among these people online. They're, they're all on Stormfront, you know, together, and some of the discussions will get heated over issues like Russia, Ukraine, for mm -hmm. example. You know, you get neo-Nazis in Russia and neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and then they get together on the same neo-Nazi forum and think things, like, mm -hmm. get really explosive. Um, Latin America is a really interesting one because a lot of the people who are making the music in Latin America would call themselves white, and then the people in... Europe are saying, are you, are you really? You know, and some of them really are. Some of them are 100% German, German, German. And, and then some of them aren't because uh, they, Latin America has historically just had different ideas about what it means to be white. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like the, the whiter you were, the further you were up the totem pole. Um, so if you had one black grandparent, for example, but and three white grandparents, you would still sort of make the claim that you were white quite often because that could help you get jobs versus the person who has one white grandparent and three black grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, and in America, where it's, um, it's historically been kind of the opposite, where if you were mixed, often it was, or, and Nazi Germany was maybe the epitome of that, was if you were mixed blood, that was like the worst thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you be one or the other, but don't be in the middle was the message that we got a lot. Um, and so a lot of these Latin American musicians would join a neo-Nazi band to try and make the claim that I'm white, even if um, 
the activists from Germany are looking at photos of them going like, there, there ain't no way you're white. Um, and, and you wonder why somebody would make that claim. It's because in Latin America, that is actually something that would, yeah. you know, potentially help your social status among certain demographics of the population. So that was, a, that was a really interesting one when I started getting into that and the discourse on neo-Nazi forums about what to do with this Latin American music and which of these bands are really Aryans and which of them really aren't. I mean, it, it just gets really thorny and ugly and political and um, ad hominem attacks left and right, exactly mm -hmm. as one might expect. Um, another really interesting case is Eastern Europe, which obviously um, a large segment of the Eastern European population was not considered to be Aryan, considered to be, um, you know, white by Hitler. And all of a sudden now, these are some of the most uh, robust white power movements on the planet because Putin is encouraging them and some of the weaker governments in the former Soviet states are not cracking down on them. And so people in Germany who are under you know, heavy censorship are looking at this and going like, wow, you've, you've got this strong community going and saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't engage in these wars among European populations with, you know, the, what they call brother wars. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have white people killing white people. Let's bring you into the fold. And there's really been this reformulation of what it means to be uh, racially superior, to suddenly include Russians and Ukrainians and Poles and things that, that were not included by Hitler. And they, they certainly are part of it now. Mm -hmm. So. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Mackenzie, your research is mainly concentrated on, um, on Poland, a uh, country that recently makes the front page of the news uh, when it comes to politics of memory, racism and hate, anti-Semitism. Uh, something that is particularly interesting uh, because we have a kind of a paradox. On one hand, Poland is kind of nostalgic for its Jewish past, and we have a lot of scholars um, talking and publishing about how Poles are uh, nostalgic of their Jews and celebrating their, their, their Jewish past, uh, emphasizing on Jewish-Polish dialogue through culture and music. And I mean, in the United States, I'm, there's a lot of our events uh, in relation to Polish-Jewish dialogue. But on the other hand, Poland is also a place where extremist groups are growing in court in their uh, radical ideology. So how can we think about contemporary Poland and its soundscapes in relation with this ideological tension? Yeah, I think each of those kind of polarities that you just discussed has musical analogs. So there's a real interest in Jewish music festivals as a way of performing this dialogue and of recovering some of the lost Jewish past. And sociologists who work on this have pointed to a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is a kind of um, nostalgia for a multi-ethnic state that was destroyed during the Holocaust. Some of it also has to do, people theorize, with uh, navigating more modern concerns about whether Poland is a kind of cosmopolitan, inclusive society or whether it's defined along um, kind of other and more national criteria. Um, you also see music playing an important role in the radical right-wing parties that attempt to uh, rehabilitate the legacy of interwar fascism. Mm -hmm. So um, last year there was, for example, a concert on Castle Square that included performances of some songs associated with that group. I think it's important not to give those groups too much political credit, the poem poem Poland, but their, their, their presence is certainly worrying, and they're certainly using music as part of those efforts. But in many ways, the, the most visible or the most audible examples of music being used politically today operate somewhere in the middle of that spectrum um, and are often associated with views of the Second World War as being a defining cataclysm in the history of the Polish nation um, and are often used to kind of portray Poles as victims of that, yeah. that process. So I brought in a clip today of an event that speaks to some of these concerns. I, I'll just say a few words before we listen to it. 
This is a concert held in Warsaw's largest public space. It occurs every August 1st to commemorate the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. This was a failed uprising against the Nazi occupiers in the attempt to regain control of Warsaw before the Soviet army arrived. Um, this concert it takes the form of a sing-along. That sing-along is actually modeled on the film I played for you earlier. Mm -hmm. It's called Warsawians Sing Non-Forbidden Songs. Mm -hmm. If you go, as I did several times, you're handed a songbook with the lyrics and the text. There's an orchestra on the stage, there's a choir, and then everyone kind of sings along these songs associated with the Warsaw Uprising. So let's listen to it, and then I have a few more things to say. Uh, before listening to this clip, I would like to invite you to write your question for the Q&A. And please remember that I will read your question, so it's very important for me to be able to read. <laughs> about this. First, the f this event is relatively new. Um, it's only a little bit over a decade old. So despite this kind of pre presenting itself as a con continuity from the war, it's really anything but that. Um, it also draws massive crowds, as you saw. The last one um, had self-reported numbers of around 18,000. It's usually in the kind of upper tens of thousands. Um, and I think what you see here is this music from the war being performed and being experienced by relatively normal people. You know, there's a, a kind of actually takes in a wide swath of um, the Warsaw population and makes some participants in the kind of memory politics that are currently quite um, at the forefront of Polish politics. Kirsten, you also brought us a very, just to, before my last question, um, an interesting clip uh, that I thought it was very interesting because this is a kind of a musical genre that we might not necessarily uh, expect. I mean, I know, but <laughs> maybe some people will not necessarily expect to have this kind of musical genre as part of the white supremacy uh, movement. So should we listen to the clip and then we'll talk? Let's do this. Daddy, what is that on his arm? A tattoo. Daddy, what does it say? Wood. Daddy, what does it mean? Well, you know, a cracker, a peck of wood, a hard wood, hell, the wood pile. Wood. I'm a wood. Wood. I'm a wood. You could test the blood in my veins Started out in control but now I'm going insane Walk with a cane and a fake lamp Have you feeling the pain of a bitch getting pimped? Call my flow tempo Till it ain't too short tempo And your whole head explodes Another episode and I'm out like your lights I got punch when I drink the punch of Okay, I'm just pausing If we can think about cultural appropriation uh, <laughs> We can <laughs> Uh, but it will lead us to another question. Um, but yeah, can you tell us about this this clip? Yeah, um, so these guys are affiliated with a neo-Nazi prison gang called the Peckerwoods. Um, so the, and the band name is, is Woodpile. And so that's what's going on, and this is kind of their their anthem. But they're, you know, they've got some other stuff that's up on uh, YouTube as well, including some 
pretty snazzy looking professional music videos. Um, I, I picked this one because this is kind of the the white boy anthem at the moment. But uh, the some of their like music video stuff does have uh, surprisingly high production value. I mean, the the classic thing in the '90s was you know people laughed it off because a lot of the music was low quality in terms of you know recording quality and performance quality and stuff and. Uh, uh, that's certainly not the case with groups like this. You do get, you know, people who are working on a professional level. And yeah, they said for decades, you know, never white power hip hop. Never, 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 never. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, the kids have stopped listening to rock and roll by and large. And they're um, like all regimes before them, like Hitler. Um, going to use whatever they have to use. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, they're quite omnivorous. Mm -hmm. Which lead us to uh, wondering what's next. But I'm going to open the floor and we'll start with our Q&A. Uh, very interesting question about um, how is class um, or social status connected to different types of Nazi or supremacist music, white supremacist music? So who wants to? Uh, s there were a number of the real movers and shakers in the early white power music movement. William Pierce was a very prominent thinker um, who owned resistance records for a while and said very publicly that he himself did not listen to this music. He didn't like it. He listened to Tchaikovsky. <laughs> You know, and he was a guy who had a PhD in physics, which of course you know qualified him to write all of this like philosophy and um, lifestyle advice. But he, you know, was sort of another one of these frustrated academics um, who got booted from the academy when people found out that he was, you know, advocating mass murder and things like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, and, and he was a guy who owned this record label um, that, you know, it, at least they said for a couple of years in the 90s was grossing like a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's very baked into the music of the Second World War period, I think. Um, when you see these kind of hierarchies established between classical music and entertainment music, mm -hmm. Uh, that's getting interpreted in kind of civilizational or racial terms, but those distinctions ultimately derive from a sort of way of looking at class and consumption of music. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's, it's weaponizing, if you will, class distinctions that have been around since the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, somebody is asking about uh, Jewish Music Festival in Krakow. The, 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 I know it's yeah. not um, mm -hmm. necessarily um, uh, your... You, the main discussion here, but how can we interpret um, the Polish tolerance of Jews and the role of music in that matters in relation to maybe what you just have shown, um, Mackenzie? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I think you have to remember that when we when we think about Poland, we, we have to remember that there are a lot of different segments of Poles and that Jewish music festivals are not going to be drawing all of Poles, but certainly within the West-leaning um, kind of cultured intelligence, you know, there is generally a great interest in those types of things. So I guess I would, I would kind of have to want to take that question back to looking at who's the audience mm -hmm. for this kind of event mm -hmm. and not to see it as merely a symbol of what's going on or not going on in Poland, but that there's a market for this kind of thing and that market has been established for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. yes. this is, uh, I haven't been there since 2011, but I know my experience was that, you know, there, there was, there's a lot of really cool, really dynamic stuff happening, but there's a healthy dose of exoticism as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an interesting question about um, a kind of a relationship or the connection that we can think about the um, recent um, hate crimes and um, the role of um, or the significance of racist neo-Nazi music in uh, and more specifically performances and I will add also the the presence of this music in the social media uh, can we identify any connection between between uh, the level of okay I'm gonna there is the action and also the role of music yes and no 
Um, and yes, uh, so there is certainly correlation. We have to be very careful about establishing causation. You don't want to say, you know, well, this person listened to Screwdriver and therefore, you know, dragged James Bird behind a truck until, you know, mm -hmm. his, you know. So you, you never want to say that. Um, because, the, you know, the, the same piece of music with a different listener can make that person want to run and vomit. Um, it's, it's really true. It, it's sort of a, about what the individual listener takes from it. Um, on the other hand, yeah, there are a huge number of violent crimes, um, as we saw with the keynote speech. She was talking about like the, the large number of violent crimes that are associated with white power movements. Um, and it goes back to like the function of music in human psychology in um, some of the best guesses for why humans developed musical behavior in the first place. Of course, it helps us remember things, but it also helps us sort of synchronize uh, our emotional state with the people mm -hmm. around us. Um, it, it solidify, it does solidify social bonds and things like that. And so there are cases where bands have been successfully prosecuted, especially in Germany, where the laws are quite strict. There's a band called Lanzer, um, Michael. Regener was the, the lead singer, and the, the band was declared a criminal organization, ordered to disperse, and he tried to come out of jail afterwards and form a new band that was basically doing the same thing with different people, and that one got shut down as well, and I haven't heard much from him in the last couple of years. Um, because there were crimes where teenagers would be on the streets screaming out the lyrics to you know like songs like Africa for apes and send them all back and things mm -hmm. like that and then go and knife an immigrant to death um, and that happened more than once actually with it Lanzo happened to be the like the most popular German neo-nazi band in the late 90s early 2000s um, another example of, of, of a band that had fairly slick production values and some decent musicians in it um, so, so there, there are cases where courts have established causation. There, there have been cases like the guy who um, killed 77 people at the summer camp near Oslo, um, who said in his manifesto that he had listened to a Swedish singer named Saga. A, a, yet another, she, that's a woman, and another example of a fairly um, well-trained musician, they called her the Swedish Madonna of the far right, and like quite attractive woman who's, you know. so, so, so yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there are links, um, but how do you prove what caused yeah. what? Mm -hmm. um, now a question in relation to Jewish music um, and how um, white supremacists interpret and think about Jewish music, so that's my how I will translate the question to you, um, Kirsten. And maybe Mackenzie, if you can tell us historically how um, Jewish music was perceived at that time in relation to, um, I know we talk a lot about uh, cosmopolitan uh, music and it was in opposition to the Nazi regime and, and all their aesthetics. So how Jewish music was portrayed, not only portrayed, but perceived much more. So who won? maybe Mackenzie would like to start with their historical background. Yeah, then. sure. Um, in, you often encounter this trope of the Jew as being an unrooted cosmopolitan, and that's certainly not only in the music scene, but it does play out particularly in particularly powerful ways there. Part of that has to do with the fact that music is already fairly internationalized by the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. People are routinely traveling for schooling across Europe and even sometimes beyond. So while it's often not seen as problematic for Poles to go to Paris to study, when Jewish composers or composers who even have a kind of hint of Jewish background go to do the same thing, they're cut off from the nation in a lot of critical discourse. So they're seen as somehow different and not belonging and excluded. So you see that kind of trope play out in, in fairly um, standard ways. That gets also mapped onto uh, compositional aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of good music being created um, that speaks to a national mission, and then there's music that's kind of synthetic of many different styles, or that's ungrounded, or that's, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, these are incredibly vague terms, and that's 
actually kind of the point that, that no one can really point to the Jewishness in music as much as anti-Semitic writers have been trying to do that since the late 19th century. And instead, what you have is a kind of critical discourse that coalesces around what Jewishness could or should mean. Right. So Kirsten would like to tell us if Jewish music is part of their discussion and also how they situate themselves in relation to. So previously, you would talk about hip hop and rap and how they, you know, they really were like, never and ever. And then and, 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 uh, can we imagine that tomorrow they will uh, use a kind of a, a Jewish melody and transform the lyrics and make it a kind of a white supremacist music or song? You know, there have been some cases actually where uh, people took, so I, I think especially especially African American songs, um, it, like uh, some some Chuck Berry songs, or uh, there was also one that that took uh, "Great Balls of Fire" by Jerry Lee Lewis, who was white but was seen as playing a black form of music when he was on the market, um, mm -hmm. and made sort of sarcastic. Um, versions of them. There was when like Johnny B. Good, a screwdriver did a version called Johnny Joined the Clan. Um, mm -hmm. And there was uh, the Rahoa uh, version of Great Balls of Fire that was like, goodness gracious, Third Reich. Like, you know, you just killed a K word, don't it feel right? Goodness gracious, Third Reich. Um, and those kinds of things. I don't think they're sitting around talking about, you know, c complaining about klezmer music. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, I don't. I don't really hear a lot of discussion on the web forums about, you know, like a Sephardic folk song. Um, <laughs> I don't think they're particularly aware of those forms, frankly. But what you do hear is people saying that anything that's kind of pop culture, anything that is owned by, you know, Virgin Records, Columbia Records, the, you know, the um, African American music, most hip hop, the mm -hmm. the big name stuff. Uh, that that is all the Jewish world conspiracy um, taking over entertainment news media and all of that. So, so you know, instead of kind of focusing on the things that musicologists would refer to as Jewish music, um, they're focusing on anything that could potentially be defined as part of this world conspiracy as, you know, this is what the Jews are doing to try and make our kids, you know, marry black people and breed the white race out of existence. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, another question in relation to white supremacists and musical genre and aesthetic, it seems that the, the question of aesthetic raised a lot of interest. So um, country music, uh, what was the role and the place of country music? Uh, and how does it play a role, or does it play a role in relation to white supremacist music? That was actually my way in to this research topic um, because I was going to write my master's thesis on country music, um, discovered that everything I wanted to say had already been said, and uh, was casting around and found like two sentences in a book uh, saying, you know, in the 1960s the Ku Klux Klan had sponsored a little bit of really racist country music um, by, they, they mentioned Johnny Rebel and I think Otis and the Three Bigots and a, and a couple of others. and. Um, <laughs> And indeed, this stuff is out there. And if you want to go type it into YouTube, you will never get that out of your head again. The, um, mm -hmm. Johnny Rebel, especially, um, was it, like he was a session musician in in Nashville, um, so so he he could play his guitar. Um, and he came out with some anti Osama bin Laden songs again in 2006. He kind of resurfaced after about 40 years. Uh, there's not a lot of this stuff actually in. Um, the catalogs of CDs and stuff, you, you don't see too much of it. Um, I think be par uh, partially because you actually had to be able to sing. Um, and in the 90s, like mm -hmm. a lot of the guys kind of just came in and, and shouted into the microphone sometimes mm -hmm. quite adeptly, but, um, but that wasn't the style they were going for when this was kind of at its peak. Um, in some ways, country music gets a really bad rap and has had you know, if you, the people will always point to Loretta Lynn having been partially Native American and Charlie Pride, and uh, who is African American and you know played on the Grand Ole Opry, and um, you know, and yet the, those strains of uh, racist thought are there. This dialectic with the sort of forgotten white man has always been there. Uh, country music being the the place where people go when their lives are kind of broken and they don't know where else to go. Um, 
uh, I mean, that, that is something that they've cultivated in the lyrics to the songs. I mean, those, those, are, those are the tropes for a reason, and it certainly is appealing to the same um, demographics who voted for Donald Trump. I also listen to it. I listen to a lot of country music, um, and there are lots of musicians out there who are very vocally anti-racist. Um, the first conference presentation I ever gave was on the Dixie Chicks, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, that's a complicated question. question. Okay. Uh, I will conclude with a, a question in, in relation to maybe our role as uh, scholars and as educators, um, also dealing with music in relation to ideology and politics. Um, so do we have a role um, to play beyond the classroom, so an intellectual circus, to fight against or to commit the spread of this radical ideology in relation to music? And in, if so, how do, do you envision uh, such a role? So. I think there's often an assumption that music uh, doesn't convey meaning or politics. I mean, that's a that's a kind of attitude you might encounter on the the street. Um, and I think there is a role to be played in in kind of correcting that view that music is an important part of who we are and what we do as human beings. And that is both for the good sides and for the bad sides. Um, I think people who study music tend to have an interest in um, Understanding how it works works in the world, and to some degree, you know that disseminating that knowledge is an important part of what we're doing. Um, when it comes to kind of other questions of outreach or like changing this repertoire in some ways, that's where I think we need to sort of partner or work with other performers and practitioners in that space who are able to, you know, create music that has a slightly better mm -hmm. or more positive spin. Thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, I mean, this and this is be beyond music. This question is beyond music um, because music's a lens into this world. Music for me has always been a, a, a lens into examining what happens in human psychology when we hurt each other, um, why we hurt each other, and why we hate each other, why we love each other. And uh, you know, it, I guess it really depends how much you want the world to change. If you want to have a nice academic career and and go home. And you know, watch Netflix on the weekends. You can do that if you want the world to change. Then you go to your senator's town hall meetings and you vote, and you um, go and you volunteer in prisons, and you do anything you can do. You go work with marginalized kids, and you know, to try and um, give chances to people who haven't historically had them and you sit and you listen to the people who are leaving white power movements and you talk to people with respect and you model things like the 60s activists said the personal is political what you're doing with your life in your off time what you're doing you know with your children with your romantic partners with your students in your classroom with what you eat you know, um, is, is affecting climate change, which is affecting people's lives in war-torn areas. I mean, everything matters. Of course it does, has to. Thank you. I just have a last question. Um, so uh, I don't know if maybe, Kirsten, you, you might be able to respond to this question. In relation to ISIS theme, I know it's not related to, to white supremacy, but maybe you have, um, you can tell us about the relationship between white supremacists and ISIS music, if there is any kind of connection, or? I don't know tons and tons about ISIS music. I know there are some really thorny issues um, with it because uh, the, the stricter you get in Islam, the less they kind of like music in general, like representation um, in, in Islam tends to get quite strict. Even the visual art is very you know, geometric and non-representational. Um, and so, so I, I don't know tons about it, but I do know that there, there is a long history of links between like, you know, Nazi Germany, for example, and, and the Middle East and sort of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, there were a lot of white power leaders who were looking at the September 11th, 2001 bombings going like, Gosh, I wish we could have done that. And you, I mean, you you see quotes by mm -hmm. them saying, you know, here we are standing. You know, people that we 
referred to as you know these these people who are just living in huts in the desert it turns out that they are accomplishing something that we couldn't do um, it, the links are, are there I, I don't know about links between the musical scenes because I haven't looked into that you know okay. I'm not an expert there so thank you, thank you for this wonderful, uh, outstanding discussion and dialogue. Um, I would like, first of all, to applaud our two guests. And you. Thank you. Thank you so much.